Welcome to you all to worship with First United Church of Oak Park. We are an open community united in love and justice, which means that there is a place for you here. Whoever you are, wherever you are on life's journey or the journey of faith, for here we proclaim a God who loves all. So welcome to you if you are feeling lost in these days. For here we proclaim a God who seeks and finds the lost. Welcome to you if you are feeling lonely. For here we proclaim a God who is beside us always, standing with us in times of need. Welcome to you if you are feeling anxious for things to get back to normal, and welcome to you if you are dreading the moment where things open up even just a little bit. We are an open community, open-hearted with one another. So welcome to you, to worship. We hope that this time feeds your spirit and that you know God in this time as close as your own breath. I am thrilled to be able to welcome to worship today a guest preacher, Reverend Quinn Caldwell, who I count as a colleague and a friend. Quinn is best known for his work with the Still Speaking Writers Group for the United Church of Christ, publishing books and daily devotionals and reflections on faith for the life that we really do lead today. Quinn is a father and an author and a herder of goats and a snappy dresser and all sorts of wonderful things as well. We are thrilled to be able to welcome Quinn as our guest preacher today. This is one of the upsides of our coronavirus situation is that we are able to welcome a guest preacher who lives in upstate New York. We are able to welcome him today and hear the good news from Quinn. So welcome Quinn to our worship. We are thrilled to have you here with us today. It's been a long time since we gathered in the sanctuary and shook hands with each other. Do you remember that moment, the passing of the peace? Remember the feeling of someone saying to you and only you, the peace of Christ be with you. Do you remember that feeling of someone looking right at you despite the crowd surrounding you, offering you a moment of needed connection and peace? Wouldn't it be nice to hear the peace of Christ be with you today? Not a generic one that goes out to the whole internet, but one that is meant just for you. Would you give someone that gift today? Would you pick up your phone and shoot a text or write on someone's Facebook wall and bid them peace? Let them know that you're thinking of them, them specifically, and that you want to offer them that moment of peace in these chaotic days, a peace that is just for them. So take a moment now and share that peace. The peace of Christ be with you. Oh 
your child while I run this race. I'm your child while I run this race. I'm your child while I run this race. For I don't want to run this race in vain. Search my heart while I run this race. Search my heart while I run this race. Search my heart while I run this race. For I don't want to run this race in vain. Guide my feet while I run this race. Good morning. The numbers guy in me knows that it's been 138 days since the governor told us all to pack up our toys and go home. I begrudgingly relocated my work toys from a nice sunny office with a big desk to a card table in my basement, and I was angry about it. I've always hated working at home. I like a clean separation between my work world and the rest of my life. That clear boundary was impossible thanks to the governor. Then the Paycheck Protection Program came around. This was a huge development for me and for my clients. Now I was grumpy and overworked. What else arrived unwelcome with the pandemic? Couldn't go to the gym anymore. Used to go four or five times a week. No more creative cooking for large family Friday night dinners. Just cooking for two. Couldn't see my mom. She's in a retirement community in Ohio. Couldn't go to church. The couldn't do this and no more of that. That list goes on for quite a while. So here's a peek inside my head. My brain organizes a schedule and agenda for each day. Most days, this agenda remains a closely held secret to everyone but myself. So when colleagues or friends or family want to do something that isn't scheduled on my personal agenda, I have to get past feeling upset that someone else has intruded into my carefully cultivated but never announced plans. It's a constant litany of, why are you making me do something spontaneous and outside of my plans? I know, I know life is what happens when you make other plans. But those first weeks of shelter in place were a bumpy ride with a lot of self-pity and whining. Fast forward to the first week of August, four months later. Biggest takeaway so far? When life gives you lemons, make lemonade. And thank God for the ability to transform the sour into the sweet. Currently, I'm enjoying working from home. It helps a lot that my best friend, my wife, is also working from home. I've spent more time face-to-face with my kids, albeit it's over Zoom, than I have in years. I've developed a meditation habit, something that had been on my bucket list for decades. I'm sleeping better than I did before. I can't explain it, but I'll take it. I'm still cooking for others, only now it gets wrapped up in foil and shipped off to other houses for consumption. I'm still going to church. It's YouTube, but it's definitely church. I'm embarrassed to admit that once again, the pandemic has forced me to relearn some familiar lessons. Gratitude makes a difference. Everything's not about me. And one person's upset apple cart is another person's shiny new toy. When we emerge on the other side of this pandemic, I hope to continue to work from home, at least some of the time. Continue to notice all the half-full glasses, 
continue to worship with you at First United. Please join me in prayer. God, help us see the places where your abundance lives. Help us direct our energies to serve others. Help us live as accomplices for justice. Help us endure this crazy, blurry, hectic 2020 with grace, compassion, and humor. And please, please watch over all our sick and scared sisters and brothers. Amen. Hello, how are you all doing today? I hope you are doing well, and I'm so glad that you are here with me today. I wanted to show you some things that have been um, collecting near my front door, and I wonder if some of these things are collecting near your front door, or if your parents are carrying them around all the time, or if you have them in your backpack, or something. So if you look at my front table, there's a box, much like this one, but I just grabbed a few things off of it. And in it and on my table, you will find um, things like wipes in different packages and sizes and all kinds of hand sanitizers, big bottles and spray bottles and small bottles and even smaller bottles. And you'll find some gloves and a thermometer and we have a whole rack of um, hooks with our masks hanging on them and I, I actually love my masks I love the colors and everything these are some of my favorite colors and I love the rainbow so I'm sure you have a lot of these things at your house and part of your everyday life these days. And the reason we have all of these things is to make sure that our hands are clean, right? And to make sure we get all the bacteria off and to protect ourselves, that's why we wear masks, um, to keep ourselves healthy and the people that we love healthy. And it, it feels like we have these all, all these kinds of rules and things that we're following if we're leaving our house, if we're going anywhere. Um, and this has become a really big part of our lives because it, it is important, um, but it, it, has, it didn't always used to be this way. And I was thinking about our scripture today and how back in Jesus' time, they had all kinds of rules about things that they um, should or shouldn't do or ways that they needed to clean themselves or their hands before they could eat or interact with people just like how we're having these rules right now. Um, and they had these because it was super important to them to be clean and to be pure um, before God and to um, have these ways of uh, interacting with one another that were um, healthy and safe. But in our scripture today, um, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he says something very interesting and something very strange to them. He's talking about how it's not the most important thing to have your outsides be clean as much as it is your insides. What does that mean? How do we clean our insides? Or how do we make sure they're clean? Or what does that mean? It's, it seems a very silly, strange thing. But what he means is it's not as important to make sure that um, our hands are clean if we're not going to be able to say nice things and be kind and loving to one another. It is very important right now in this time of COVID that we are using our hand sanitizers and our masks and everything that we can to be healthy and safe and keep our loved ones and our brothers and sisters and siblings healthy and safe. But a lot of that won't mean much if we're not able to be kind and loving to one another. Right now, doing these things is a way that we 
do show our love for one another. But it's important to have a clean and loving heart and soul as much as it is to use hand sanitizer and wear a mask. It sounds strange in our scriptures, but it was really important for Jesus to shift that focus for his disciples and for his people. We have had our focus shifted to the hand sanitizers and masks and wipes, but we still need to remember that it's what comes out of our hearts to other people that can tell a lot about how we love one another. So even as you're wearing your mask and you're putting on your hand sanitizer, as much as that is a way that we care for and love one another, remember that the things that we say and the actions that we take can show how much we are loving of others. And that is a way that we show our love for God too. Have a wonderful day and thank you for joining me. Listen now for the word of God in the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 15. Then Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands before they eat. Then Jesus called the crowd to him and said to them, Listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? He answered, Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles. For out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. First United Church of Oak Park, I'm sending you greetings, grace, and peace from the wilds of upstate New York, from your siblings in the New York Conference, and from the Homer Congregational Church, United Church of Christ, where I am a member. Thank you, John, for the invitation to preach with you this morning. Thank you to all the pastors of your church for making space for me to be with you, if not in your pulpit, the way I would have liked, then at least in your worship video. It is an honor to have been asked to do this. Thank you to all of you for your attention this morning, and I hope for your prayers, which I covet. If you pause right now and say a prayer for your preacher this morning, I'm sure God will find a way to make it retroactive back to Wednesday, which is when I'm actually recording this. With our God, all things are possible. So always pray for your preacher. I hope you'll pray for me. Thank you, last but certainly not least, to God and to Al Gore for the internet. We've always known that the church around the world across the country, from town to town, state to state, has been deeply, powerfully connected. But who would have thought even just a few years ago that we would be able to be connected in this way to worship together? It is a miracle, and it's a good one. I want to apologize for something this morning. I think it is so cheesy for people to do Zoom videos or to preach in front of bookshelves. It just feels so like pretentious or whatever. And I want you to know that I am aware of that and I have no choice this morning. My four-year-old is upstairs taking a nap. At least that's what he's supposed to be doing, but for sure he's at least having quiet time, though he's probably not sleeping. And this is the only room in the house where I can speak at a normal volume and he won't hear me and come out to investigate what's going on. So it's weird, it's cheesy, and a little pretentious to be in front of a bookshelf, but there it is. This is where it could happen. And if the sermon is boring, think of it like stained glass windows. You know, if the sermon gets boring when you're in your sanctuary, which I'm sure it never does with your pastors, but you have something to look at in the room, right? So think of the bookshelves like that. If the sermon gets boring, you can try to figure out what books are on my shelves. It's a whole thing. The New York Times writes articles about the art of trying to figure out the books that are behind celebrities when they appear on TV. So 
There you go. Sorry, and you're welcome. Will you pray for me? Holy One, may the words of my lips and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. We long for this because you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So, I used to, and when I say used to, I mean like pre-2020, I used to have this whole rant that I did about hand sanitizer. I hate it. I hated it more then than I do now, but I really don't love it. And in those days, I really, really didn't love it. I was always just like, wash your hands. Do you not have running water? Some people don't, and that's legit. And if you wanna be clean without running water, fine, then use hand sanitizer. But otherwise, like, what's wrong with soap and water? That's the better thing to do anyway. I was aware that not only were there people that didn't have running water, and that's real, there are also people who are immunocompromised or immunosuppressed, and that's real, and they may be using hand sanitizer for that reason, fine. But I also just felt like Purell and the people who used to have those um, cart sanitizer wipes when you go into every store, I just felt like they were selling us a bill of goods. They were like tricking us into buying their product. The world is not that dirty, I would say. I was also aware that things are different in healthcare settings, that people who work in hospitals and nursing homes and places like that need to keep their hands clean in a different way. So in the midst of this whole long rant about hand sanitizer and how dumb it is and what a waste it is, I would always be careful to say, but there are people like doctors who need to use it to keep their hands clean. However, you are not a doctor. Well, you might be, but the rest of the people, you're not doctors, I would say. They just don't need to be that clean. And by the way, they're not actually that clean when you use hand sanitizer. You just kill the bugs on your hands and leave their little carcasses there. They're not that clean. So this whole rant, on and on and on, that I would go on. And then you know what happened. 2020 changed a lot. But pre-2020, I actually think that Jesus would probably have agreed with me. It's actually my lived experience that Jesus and I agree on most things. Take the story from today's scripture, right? Jesus and his disciples and the Pharisees, they're having this discussion or argument maybe about hand washing, about why you do it, what it means, what the point is. The Pharisees come to Jesus one day and say, why aren't your disciples washing their hands before they eat? And Jesus responds with this big, long thing about what's clean and what's not, what makes you clean and what doesn't make you clean or unclean. He makes the famous poop joke. Isn't it good to have a savior that can make a poop joke once in a while about what goes in your mouth goes into the sewer? It's great. But the argument they're having, right, is about cleaning your hands, why you would do it, why you wouldn't do it, when it's necessary, and when it's not necessary. And it is easy, if you have been a Christian your whole life and haven't looked too deeply into the background of the New Testament, it is easy to make the Pharisees villains in this story. Not least because it seems that the Gospel writers mostly wanted them to be villains. But the Pharisees are more complicated, more complex, more diverse, and maybe better than our Bible wants us to believe. So, a word about Pharisees. They were, in first century Judaism, one of a number of groups who were talking about how best to be Jews in the world, how best to be the people of God in the world. Pharisees were not monolithic. They had conversations, arguments, and debates within Phariseeism itself, as well as with other Jews in the world. Jesus may or may not have lined up with one of those groups, but for sure he spent a lot of time with Pharisees. He argues a fair amount with them in the Bible. He calls them names. They come to him by night. He eats with them. They provide for him and his followers after his death. The Pharisees are around Jesus, or he's around them, a lot. It might be worth wondering why someday. Not today. 
The Pharisees had a lot of beliefs, a lot of arguments they made about the nature of things and how best to be God's people in the world. But one of the things they seemed to believe in, one of the projects they were working on, was the idea of making a nation of priests. That's how they talked about it, a nation of priests. Now remember, first century Judaism, we're in the neighborhood of Jerusalem, and in Jerusalem is the temple, which is the center of the center of everything for most Jews. Everybody was supposed to try to make it there periodically because there in the temple were priests. And the priests there did what priests in every time and place do in their various ways. They acted as bridges as interlocutors, as intermediaries, and as advocates, connecting heaven and earth. If there was a bridge between heaven and earth, the plinth that it rested on on the earthly side was right there in the temple, and it was these priests doing their job there in the temple that made it possible for the prayers and concerns of the people to rise heavenward and the word of God to trickle down earthward. They couldn't do this, or didn't think they could do this, as sort of normal people. To do this job well, the priests believed that they had to increase their holiness valence a little bit over sort of regular people out in the street. And they had a whole bunch of ways to increase that valence, to make them vibrate at a frequency just a little bit closer to God's frequency, to make it just a little bit easier for them to do their job of being a bridge an interlocutor, an advocate, an intermediary between the people and their God. To do this, they had a whole bunch of rituals and practices prescribed for them in the Jewish Bible, what, what Christians often think of as the Old Testament or the Jewish scriptures. You see a bunch of them in Leviticus, they show up elsewhere, all kinds of rules, guidelines, and hopes for, the how pre for how the priests will make themselves holy enough to do their job well. The Pharisees believed that everyone could be a priest, that everyone could have direct access to the mind and the heart of God, that every single member of Israel, every Jew in the world, officially a priest or not, could in fact act as a priest, could be a bridge, an interlocutor, an intermediary, an advocate, could proclaim the word of God to the people and lift the people's claims and prayers and needs up to God. If this sounds familiar to you, it might be because you are a Protestant. If you're watching this video right now, you are even just for a few moments, part of a Protestant church. And one of the great insights of the Protestant Reformation about 500 years or so ago was the idea of, what? Say it with me. Say it home on your couch if you know it. The priesthood of all believers. Basically the very same idea that every member of the church, every Christian, I would argue every human, they might not have put it that way, has direct access to the mind and the heart of God. Every single person can act as that bridge, interlocutor, intermediary, advocate, and mouthpiece. So that's what the Philistines were trying to make happen in their time and place. They were part of a democratizing movement to take the power, maybe the glory, the respect that the priests had, and convince everyone that they could have it too. They too could have that kind of stature, that kind of important work to do in the world. But, they said, if you were going to have that kind of power and stature and work, then you would also have to have that kind of obligation. It would be your job to try to increase your holiness, Valence, enough for you to rise to the occasion of acting as a priest of God among the people. So, this is why you see the Pharisees in this story and elsewhere arguing that people ought to be doing certain things, taking on certain rituals, behaving in certain ways, trying to make themselves just a little more holy, to rise a notch or two above where they live in their daily lives, to follow some rules from their scriptures that previously only priests 
had to follow. And this, this is where Jesus and the Pharisees and his disciples meet in the midst of this conversation. He points out that the hand washing that they're talking about matters as a symbol for sure. Today we know that it matters for literal cleanliness and literal salvation as well, but he's saying, you know, it's a symbol, and if, it, if you want to do that, that's fine, but you can actually increase your holiness, Valence. You can get in touch with God in other ways too. So if people don't want to wash their hands, it's not a big deal. Let's focus on what really matters, says Jesus. You're not priests, he seems to say. At least you're not temple priests. You can be a new kind of priest out in the world, a new kind of bridge, interlocutor, intermediary, advocate, and mouthpiece in the world. But you're not priests, not that way. So that's where they end the argument. Roughly 40 or so years later, the argument actually gets decided for them. Forty or so years later, in the year 70 of the Common Era, the Romans, who maybe you know have been occupying the land for quite some time, they destroy the temple. The center of the center of everything, the navel of the universe, is destroyed. The location of all that holiness, all that power, all those priests acting as bridges interlocutors, intermediaries, advocates, and mouthpieces. Suddenly they have nowhere to do their job. The abode of God on earth is gone. And the argument between the, Phyllis, the Pharisees and Jesus, it gets decided in that moment. It turns out that what the Pharisees have been arguing for all along, the idea of a nation of priests, that's just what the Jews need to survive now, or at least for their religion to survive. Because if they believe that the only priests, the only people who could talk to God and talk for God to the people, if only they could do that, and they could only do it in this one place, and no one else could have that kind of power, then when that one place and that one priesthood is destroyed, then the people will be cut off from God, right? Enter the Pharisees, saying, we told you so. Here's what we'll do now. And in fact, the people do what the Pharisees have been telling them to do all along. They stri start striving to become a nation of priests. And it works. The tradition survives. Survives so well, under the guidance of the Pharisees, that almost all modern-day Judaism, all rabbinic Judaism, derives from the teachings and the ideas of the Pharisees. Think about that before you criticize them in your next Christian sermon. We don't know what Jesus would have said about the destruction of the temple. He did predict it, we think. But when it actually happened, what would he have said about what happened then? Would he have admitted that the Pharisees were right? That we should all be acting like little priests out in the world? When the cataclysm comes and destroys everything, and the only way to survive is to take the power that used to be concentrated there and let it flow out over the people. What would Jesus have said about that? And what would he have said not only about the power that overcame the people and raised them to new estate, what would he have said about their obligations as well? We don't know. We do know this. When they destroyed the temple that was Jesus's body, the location that for Christians would become the center of the center of everything, the navel of the universe, when our great high priest was destroyed, when Christ himself was broken on the cross, all the power that was in him flowed out and overtook the people. 
and suddenly they became little versions of him. Maybe not quite as powerful, quite as knowledgeable, not quite as able to communicate between God and the people, but still more than they had been before. They became little Jesuses, or if you prefer, they became Christians, which literally means little Christs. Taking on not only his power and his estate, but his responsibilities as well. When cataclysm befalls the people, they must change. When cataclysm befalls the centers of power, then others must take up that power and the responsibility that comes with it if the people are to survive. Back in 2019 and before, I had this whole rant about hand sanitizer. And the central portion of the rant, the central idea, was to say, you're not a doctor. You don't need to act like you are about to do surgery. The world isn't that dirty. Sterile technique is not required for you to live in the world because you're not a doctor. Then 2020 happened. A cataclysm, if there ever was one, or at least it feels like it to me. Then 2020 happened with SARS-CoV-2 and COVID, and everything changed, including my mind. And here's how it is now. People who never used to wear gloves to go grocery shopping, now they need to. People who never used to use hand sanitizer, except maybe to remove pine pitch from their hands, it works great for that, by the way, now we do. People who never before in their lives wore a surgical mask. Now we do, just to take the dog for a walk. We're not doctors, but suddenly we are required to, and we ought to be, acting like little doctors, little healthcare professionals out in the world, as careful of contagion, as careful of getting other people sick, not just of ourselves getting sick, but of getting other people sick as doctors and nurses in hospitals are. I don't know any more than you do what's going to happen this fall when cold and flu and COVID season is upon us again. I don't know any better than you do what's going to happen with schools or what ought to happen with schools. I don't know any better than you do. But I know this. First United Church of Oak Park. You who are trying to figure out how to find a little peace and a little centeredness and maybe a little hope in the world going forward from here. When the cataclysm happens, here's what also happens. The power, it drains into the world and touches everyone. The power of the temple drains out and overwhelms the people, or probably more likely, it is revealed to be where it always was with the people, and suddenly there is a nation of little priests, and it is the thing that allows the people and their religion to survive beyond the cataclysm. They hang Jesus up on the cross, and the power drains out of him and overwhelms his little Christs, his Christians. Or, maybe more to the point, it's revealed to be where it always was. And that is what allows them and their tradition to survive the cataclysm of his death. And in 2020, the power and the responsibility of being a doctor a healthcare professional, somebody educated about epidemiology and disease and how to stop its spread, it has flowed out of the hospitals and the clinics and the doctor's offices, or maybe more to the point, has been revealed where it always was. And now suddenly we're all acting like little doctors out in the world. 
And if history is any guide, then doing that, taking up that mantle of responsibility, acting like little doctors and nurses out in the world, that will be the thing that allows the people to survive this cataclysm as well. There were those who scoffed at the Pharisees and their ideas, but those ideas were the saving of Israel. There were those who scoffed at the followers of Jesus and their ideas, but those ideas were the saving of the people of Jesus Christ. There are those who scoff at the ideas of those who say we have to keep our hands clean in a new way and wear gloves where we didn't used to have to and put masks on when we leave our homes. There are those who scoff at those ideas, but those ideas will be the things that allow us to survive, just as they always are. We've been here before First United Church of Oak Park. This has happened to the people of God in the past. But when the power overwhelms the people and raises them to new estate and gives them new responsibilities to take care of one another and the people accept that power and that estate and those responsibilities, then the people survive. So may it be. People of God, love is still at work in and among us. Love is at work in and among us in new ways, ways we could not have dreamed up. So let's support each other and the work that God is doing through us in every way that we can. Please take a moment now to consider what you can give financially and go to firstunitedoakpark.com slash give or text First United and the amount to 73256. May God bless our gifts and may God bless you as you give.
Will you join me in prayer? Holy One, when the world around us shifts, when we are struggling to adjust, when we find ourselves in roles we never expected to fill, remind us of your faithfulness in each and every cataclysmic event faced by your people throughout all of history. As we remember your faithfulness, may our hearts be filled with peace and gratitude. We take a moment now to ask for your peace in the situations that are troubling us and to give thanks for your faithfulness everywhere we have known it. Hear now our joys and concerns. For your faithfulness in the good, the bad, and the ugly, O God, we give you thanks. May you find us faithful to you. May we become little Christs, continuing the work that must be done, not just by that one great teacher and example, but by all of us, as we learn and follow and pray as he did, saying, our creator, our mother, and our father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Though a great deal has changed in our lives because of the coronavirus pandemic, there is much that remains the same in the church. We continue to be a community of caring. We want to know what's going on in your life, joys and concerns, birthdays and milestones and achievements that are coming up. Please reach out to your deacon and let them know what is going on in your life. Or you could 
email one of the pastors. Our email addresses are on the website, or you could email prayers at firstunitedoakpark.com. People seem to think that they should only share big news, especially sad news with us, which is fine, but we also would love to hear what is going on in your life. Please reach out and share with one another and help us live into being an open-hearted community. Also going on in the life of the church, you can continue to be a part of our prayer shawl ministry, which meets on Mondays in the morning on Zoom. That is a time for fellowship and for people to come together and knit and look at new projects that they're working on and simply to be with one another. Our weekly hymn sings continue with music director Bill Chin on Mondays in the afternoon on Zoom. You can have an opportunity to sing the sacred canon with other people from the church. Finally, we are excited to be able to say that we are planning and pulling together something really exciting and fun for gathering day this year. That will be the Sunday following Labor Day Sunday. Keep in mind, Labor Day falls as late as it possibly can in the calendar. So gathering day will be September the 13th. So that's pretty late, but we are going to be having gathering day with a variety of exciting ways that we will be able to connect with one another, even across the distance that we need to keep to maintain safety with one another. More news about exactly how that is going to look will be coming in following weeks. So watch this space. Friends, in all of this, in worship, in life together, in fellowship, in community, in praying for one another, it is good to remember that even apart, we are still yet one body of Christ. Thanks be to God. May the God of hope go with us every day, filling all our lives with love and joy and peace. May the God of justice speed us on our way, bringing light and hope to every land and race. Praying, let us work for peace. Singing, share our joy with all. Working for a world that's new. Faithful when we hear Christ's call. Dios de la esperanza, danos gozo y paz. Al mundo en crisis habla tu verdad. Dios de la justicia, mandamos tu luz. Luz y esperanza en la oscuridad. Oremos por la paz. Cantemos de tu amor. Luchemos por la paz. Fieles a ti. May the God of hope go with us every day, filling all our lives with love and joy and peace. May the God of justice speed us on our way, bringing light and hope to every land and race. Praying, let us work for peace, singing, share our joy with all, working for a world that's new, faithful, when we hear Christ call. First United Church of Oak Park, thank you so much for having me with you this morning. It really is an honor. And I look forward to the day, who knows when, when we can be together in person and meet for real. Until then, remember this. Jesus said always to pray and not to faint. Do not pray for easy lives. Pray to be stronger people. Do not pray for no cataclysms, for the cataclysm is upon us. Do not pray for tasks equal to your powers, but for power equal to your tasks. Then the doing of your work will be no miracle. You will be the miracle. And every day you will wonder at the beauty of life that has come to you in Jesus Christ. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sustainer be with you this and every day. Amen. Farewell. And one more thing.
Hi, Sue S. I love you too. God be with you.